Um, so thanks for having me, everyone. Thanks for being here instead of New York. Uh, so my name is Brett, and I work at Aragon. I'm a core developer uh, for Aragon. I kind of do everything across the full spectrum. I do contracts up to front end. Um, I hope most of you are familiar with Ethereum uh, today because we'll be diving in um, quite a bit into Ethereum and looking at how we view uh, the whole technical um, spectrum from JavaScript uh, of our front end to our contracts on chain. To get started, I want to introduce you to Maria. Um, so we at Aragon, we think about Maria quite a lot and we empathize a lot with her, um, her dream and her vision. Uh, of what she wants to be. So this is Maria at her happiest moment in life. This is when she was 12, 13. She was having fun, living carefree. Uh, but at the end of the day, Maria, she wants to build companies. She wants to make something herself. She wants to participate economically in activities uh, that her country doesn't really like. That's kind of a problem. You see, her country, they like to keep all the fun for themselves. They like to be with each other. They like to hanging out by each other, but they don't want people like Maria to join the party. They also, they use force, they coerce the people like Maria into doing what they want to do through violence uh, rather than incentives, or correct incentives, let's say, versus bad incentives. And they also surveil them. They try to control their behavior, they try to control their thoughts, and they're not generally working for the people, they're working for themselves. So that's a big reason why Aragon was started and why Ultimately, our vision is to create a digital jurisdiction free from any of these um, borders, let's say. Because people like Maria, they're kind of trapped today. They're, they're trapped inside the countries that they were born into. They were born into hierarchies and bureaucracies that they can't really get out of, usually very easily. But with Aragon, when we deploy a digital network, they'll be able to opt in. They'll have the choice to say, this platform, this jurisdiction offers me greater potential, offers me greater freedoms than what I have physically. And so I can participate in economic, economic activity that I wouldn't otherwise have been able to. And it really is up to us. It, we believe very strongly that these people should have the freedom to engage in these activities. Uh, and they'll be able to do that through decentralized governance, through structures that are removing intermediaries, removing these parties that want to keep all the fun for themselves, uh, but instead dissolving that into the people and letting them decide what they want and what they find valuable. So to achieve all this, we raised a lot of money last year. Um, don't really blame us, blame, blame everyone else. Uh, but unfortunately, our token doesn't really do that much. And we're still figuring out what's happening uh, to make this token usable inside of um, the Aragon network so that we can achieve that vision. And right now, we're still working on the, the new white paper. We're still working on what exactly this is going to do. But we really want ANT to be the world's best economic uh, development currency. We want it to be used uh, between parties to collateralize their agreements, to collateralize uh, their contracts between each other so that they are mitigated from risks of one side dropping out. Um, but more details of that will follow. Uh, we're very close to releasing the first draft of this white paper, and we're really bad with dates, so we're just promising soon, but it'll be out soon, so I'll be there soon. <laughs> but what I'd like to really talk about today, and this is why we're gonna get into some code, is we released our beta version of our app about a month and a half ago at the end of, uh, at the end of March, and this is a huge technical achievement for us because from the outset, Aragon, we've really been picking by default decentralized uh, computation and decentralized networks. We want everything in the stack to be decentralized if we can. We don't want a central server. We don't want to host anything. We want anybody in the world to pick up our software and to use it. Because if we go down, they can still participate and sustain this movement by themselves. And with that, with 0.5, we've created, finally, unstoppable organizations so that the people like Maria, when they want to do something, they can put it on Ethereum, they can put it on a digital jurisdiction and say, I'm gonna create value without you letting me. I'm gonna do what I need to do, and what I want to do without you saying you can't do that. I'm gonna get into how that, um, we've achieved that um, pretty much for the rest of the talk. So we're gonna go into a really, uh, really quite a deep dive into the whole architecture of how Aragon was built. But I'd like to 
show you guys what it kind of looks like. Um, before, if you haven't any, if you haven't played with it yet, um, you can. Uh, it's at app.ergon.one. But essentially, it allows people to create organizations. We include a few apps by default. Um, we have a token manager that basically tracks who is a member of this organization. Uh, it kind of describes what their voting power is. This organization creates a token for itself. And then it, can, it uses this token to participate in votes. So members who hold tokens are able to collectively and decentralize, in a decentralized fashion participate in decision making across all the members about what this organization should do and where it should spend money. And so this finance app is pretty much an accounting view um, over what this organization holds and what its transactions have been. Now, to build this entire thing, again, we're really, by default, um, wanting to be decentralized. But we also uh, know that what we dream is just probably less than 1% of what entire humanity can dream of. And so we want to make our app extensible as well. We want to make it so that anybody in the world can develop an application that they want to install. So that if they want to extend their organization with some functionality or utility that we hadn't thought of, they're able to do that. Uh, and so we're hoping to leverage the open source community as well to see what they want in organizations and how we can help them build that. And to achieve that, we've basically made our app uh, kind of in, in two parts. We've in many ways created kind of an operating system inside a browser where for the most part we have a native context, this browser native context, and that's the wrapper. So the wrapper tells you which apps you've installed and launches those apps. And then on the right hand side we have an iframe and web worker where people like basically um, arbitrary applications are loaded into these contexts and are run uh, within these sandboxes. And now we we need a sandbox because uh, essentially we want it so that anyone can do anything inside these contexts. And so that, that kind of opens up the world for malicious attacks, scammers, things like that. So we want to control that, uh, that playground that they have so they can't reach into other applications. So a voting app, for example, can't just steal your funds because you installed it. It has to, what? Well, hopefully it just can't do that <laughs> through the sandboxing. I'll talk a little bit more about how this sandboxing really happens. So as I said, the UI is all loaded inside of uh, a web, or sorry, an iframe that controls how it's getting put, or how, how, the, how it looks to the user. We start background scripts for each of these applications when we load the apps, when we start the application. And then these scripts are talking to an Ethereum chain um, through the contracts that they have in the background. And this whole architecture kind of looks something like this. So we have kind of two execution contexts, maybe, well, ra rather it's three execution contexts. We have the wrapper on one side and the app UI on the other. And we have UI framework, we, we use React right now, but anyone uh, in their own applications can choose to do whatever they want. It's basically just controlling the DOM in some way based on state that's getting passed from a script. And then the script again is in a web worker. Underneath this, we have Aragon JS, which is like our toolkit and messaging layer. It's kind of like the middleware between Ethereum and the front end. And this is, uh, it gets a little bit complex in the native application because, or the native context, because it, handle, it has to handle a lot of messaging between these different contexts. It has to control uh, what messages are getting sent where and uh, how to route those messages and how to talk to Ethereum as well. So we'll notice there's a cache for storing state uh, for each of the applications. There's a message handler to say, okay, I got this message, what should I do with it? There's a messenger to talk to the other contexts, and then there's a Web3 module that talks to Ethereum. And uh, for the applications themselves, they have very simple models. They just basically send messages back to the server to say, I'd like to do this, please do it for me, I'll get a call back at some point. And so again, just to reiterate the point, uh, they're kind of in three different boxes there. And so for Web3, we actually talk to our contracts on chain. And these contracts, uh, we have the concept of a kernel for your organization, where this kernel is a thin layer, it's a thin wrapper with basically just a mapping of which applications you've installed and where that application lives. And so with that, 
Uh, this kernel basically has a number of apps installed. We've, by default, we install a number of things. We have an ACL layer, which is the permissioning component for this organization. We have an EVM script runner that basically can uh, execute arbitrary um, Ethereum calls. And then we have a whole bunch of applications that people can install. So let's go all the way down into the EVM and then I'll start working my way back up through the JavaScript and back onto the DOM. So Aragon OS, we completed our third version at the start of the year and we're undergoing two audits. Um, hopefully soon, again, we'll have these audits complete and then we'll be ready for a mainnet deployment. Uh, but Aragon OS was designed from the get-go to be extendable and as a framework for programming governance. It's really uh, a concept of an operating system that controls resources. And so we traditionally, we think about operating systems as hardware resource provisioning software, essentially. Your hardware, you have RAM, you have CPU, uh, you have um, disk space, et cetera. The, so, uh, the operating system kind of gives applications access to that resource. And we view the same way about Aragon OS. Instead of hardware components, now we have organizational resources. We have human capital. We have economic capital. And Aragon OS kind of allows people, applications, to uh, choose what they do. They get access to this capital and move it around, uh, execute actions, play within that type of, uh, play within that playground, let's say, of the resources that they get. So to dive in a little bit more deep into uh, Aragon OS, we'll see that, again, um, I'll get into each of these things, but this is just to demonstrate that more people can, um, or when you start an organization, you can install more applications into your organization um, if you don't like the ones we include or you want more functionality. So out of the box, we if you use Aragon OS, and it's meant to be extensible and for anyone in the world to pick and choose components from to include in their own contracts, but if you bind to the whole system, you get upgradability by default uh, for your contracts. You get a very complex permissioning management system, and you also get transaction forwarding. And we'll get into transaction forwarding a little bit later in the talk. So to do um, to do uh, upgradability, what we actually uh, try or what we actually um, deploy when someone creates an organization are just a whole bunch of proxy contracts. These proxy contracts are linked to an actual implementation on chain, very similar to the Parity wallet if you understand how that second ha hack happened. They're very similar to that design. These proxy contracts are the ones that hold state, but they defer to the actual implementation in the back um, to get the logic to execute. And we do this not because we're trying to save gas or as an optimization, but we do this because we understand that software will change. Software, you'll get new features. Your ideas will change. We'll, perhaps they might be buggy. Perhaps we make mistakes. And so if you can change the underground, underlying implementation, you are set free from a lot of those limitations that would otherwise be there. Um, for example, if our kernel, for whatever reason, is broken, you can say, uh, well, I don't, I don't really like that old kernel anymore. I'm going to upgrade to this new kernel to get some more functionality or to get a bug fix. Um, but at the end of the day, it's you who controls that upgrade versus the network or anyone else. So you still get to say, this is an immutable contract as long as I want it to be immutable. Um, and we get into the permissioning system of how you can control that. Is there a governance around that itself? Like yes. Yeah, we get into the governance um, of how that actually happens, that upgrade process as well. This is just to kind of show our proxy contract. It's really small, it's like 40 lines of code, and all it basically does is a delegate call. Uh, I'll take in some bytes, I'll take in an address, I'll call that delegate, call, or I'll do that delegate call, get the return data size, and return to the caller um, any return from that context. Uh, so basically this proxy reaches into that implementation, um, and says, okay, can you execute this thing inside my own context? So all the storage and all the state is kept inside this proxy versus the underlying implementation. And then in a different part of the contracts, we have the governance process of how you actually set which, uh, where this proxy is talking to. Now for permissions, um, this is, well, we built quite a complex permissioning system. Traditionally in Solidity, I'm, Sure, if you've ever looked at Open Zeppelin or some of these consensus contracts, they'll have like an is owner contract. 
And that basically is just like, does this address, or are you this address? If so, you can manipulate this contract in ways that are potentially dangerous. But that's a really, really, really simplified version of what real life permissioning is like. I don't have a benevolent dictator sitting up here telling me what to do. Rather, we do it collectively or we do it with a lot more complexity in the real life. So what we built out is essentially, um, it's essentially uh, a more generic framework for asking whether or not you have permission to do something. So this, this interface is really basic. You basically ask um, this app, this access control uh, list, if you have the permission to do something. You say, this is who I am, this is where I want to call, this is what I want to call, and uh, this is what data I'm trying to, trying to add to that. Th these are the parameters I'm calling with. Do I have access to that or not? And metaphorically, it's very similar to when you were smaller. Um, I assume we all have parents. You go ask your mom, hey, I'd like to, to go get candy for $5. Is that OK? And then she'll probably say, OK, I'm like, why not? You go, go get some candy. Go be happy. But then if you say, I'd like to take out $30,000 for a car, she'll probably say, no. That's, no, just maybe when you're older and you have that money yourself. But that type of question we can encode in a smart contract now with the system, with an access control list. Uh, we can kind of see this getting used a little bit. This is a very simplified um, piece of code that says, for the voting app, who can create a new vote? And you basically ask, well, does the person who's calling, uh, we'll see the auth modifier with the create votes role. Does this person have this role? If they do, allow them to create a vote. If they don't, um, they're not allowed to create a vote, essentially. And you can see this uh, in, in more complex patterns with finance, for example, um, where we pass parameters in to say, this person, do they have uh, the, the correct role? And are they also allowed to spend enough money or the amount of money that they're requesting? If so, OK, let them do that action. If not, uh, I just re reject. Is there, did you have a question? Just a question. Yeah. So is what we're voting about arbitrary? Could it be anything? Or is it a specific thing? It is arbitrary, yeah. So the voting app, um, basically, you pass it a, a script, essentially. And then when, it ex when, it, when you vote it and it's accepted, um, it just runs that script. And that script is pretty arbitrary. Brett, can you repeat the questions back just so we can Sure. So the question was, um, is the vote arbitrary <laughs> or is it about a specific thing? If it's arbitrary. Right. Yeah. So, right. Well, okay. Next, <laughs> I remember next time. <laughs> OK, so transaction forwarding, we're going to get to that in a little bit. It works better with an example. OK, uh, so using Aragon OS, we can kind of make some governance happen. And this is already what we do um, in 0 0.5. If you played it and you made an organization, this is a very similar but simplified version of the contract that we're calling. So we have a Dell factory. And this factory just creates an organization. This organization is represented by the kernel and the applications that are installed within it. So we just say, OK, make me a new kernel, initialize the caller, the root, to be the owner and manager of this entire organization for now. But what we can do is we can add a bunch more to this. And so we can say, make me, um, make me an organization, and let's add four applications. Let's install voting, vault, finance, token manager. And you can imagine other applications getting installed here. But at the end, this is the really interesting part. We set up the permissioning system so that only voting has access to do anything uh, inside this organization. We're saying, uh, finance, you have the ability to transfer funds from the vault. Voting, you have the ability to use the finance app to create payments to people and to execute payments to people. And you can also use, uh, you also have access to the token manager to mint new tokens or to uh, basically mint new tokens. And to the question before about the upgrade process, this upgrade process would be very similar. We would create a permission to say who and how uh, someone can upgrade the application underneath a proxy. And so in Aragon OS, our core design tenets was to be super primitive focused. We wanted to make the most basic components that people can need inside organizations 
and allow them to choose what they want, allow them to opt in to the components that they want in the organization, and as well to be flexible enough so that these components, if people don't like them, they can adhere to an interface and create their own so that they can extend it or modify the behavior. And so everything that I've talked about, this access control list, this kernel, um, these applications, they just have a standard interface that you can program against and you can install and everything will hopefully just work and, and connect properly together. Uh, so that was Aragon OS and we'll move away from the EVM back up to the JavaScript layer and talk a little bit about Aragon JS. So as I said before, it's a toolkit for Aragon applications, and it simplifies a lot of the middleware of talking to Ethereum contract, of using Web3, of uh, handling that execution context. And in particular, it does two fairly interesting things. It, mess it handles messaging between all the different contexts, and it also handles transaction forwarding. So to do the messaging, we have designed an RPC spec where you basically ask between the contexts what you want. Um, so the, the two-sided arrows are the ones where both sides can ask, um, and the one-sided arrows are either from the script to the server, sorry, or the UI to the, yeah, or the UI to the server. Um, and we'll look really deeply into how events and calls are being done and how that, oops, how that kind of sets up um, the application UI and the, and the state uh, from contracts, or rather how we display that state. Okay, so we'll see on the left-hand side, this is kind of our UI, this is the UI layer. The middle side is, or the middle is um, the wrapper, it's the native execution context, and the right-hand side is the web worker. So in the UI, let's say we're in the voting app, a user says, I wanna make a vote, I wanna create a new vote. So there's gonna be some logic in the UI to say, okay, you're trying to create a new vote with these parameters. Let's push that into the Aragon.js client and tell the server what we wanna do. So go through, go through the messenger, go through the handler, and then the handler will realize, oh, you're trying to make an Ethereum action. Let me make a transaction for you. And so we send that down all the way to Ethereum. We wait a bit, a couple of seconds, the event gets, or the transaction gets mined, and the function that we called has an event. And so we get back from Web3 an event uh, that we then kind of look around and say, who subscribed? Oh, someone is subscribed. Let me go to the messenger and send this event back to them. We talk to the messenger. The messenger goes to the script and says, oh, hey, I've got an event. So please uh, do something with this event. Like handle it however you want, but just you're notified that you have an event. And so this app script, it's gonna look around, it's gonna try and pull some new state, it does basically whatever it wants to do. And then it says, okay, um, I've used this new event, I'm gonna update my internal state to represent this new vote. Maybe there were four votes, now we're gonna add another vote into this vote array, so now we have five votes. And we go all the way back and push the state back to the server and back to the client. So the client goes through and says, or sorry, the, uh, the web worker's client says, I'm gonna send a message, it's gonna get handled, it's gonna to go to the cache and say, I'm, I'm trying to update the state for this application. And then the cache says, okay, I've saved it. Um, and oh, actually, I have a subscription. Someone's, um, someone is subscribed to me updating at, certain, at a certain position. So I'm gonna send this subscription or this update event back up to them. And it goes through the messenger, goes back through a couple messengers. And at the end of the day, uh, the UI gets updated state from the contract, um, and then it, it shows it to the user and everyone's happy. Uh, part of why we decided to do this was that we didn't want users to be stuck in an application to get Ethereum state. If you can imagine, you're in the app, you're maybe looking at your finances, doing whatever, um, you wanna get notified that maybe a new vote has started, maybe uh, a new action requires your attention. And so by using this paradigm, we have scripts running in the background that can notify the UI at any time based on Ethereum events and tell it, hey, you know, something's been happening. Um, you need to do something. You need to update your state. You need to show a notification. Do something interesting for the user. And then transaction forwarding is kind of, uh, it's an interesting, um, 
way to create better UX for users. So as we saw before in that example organization, only the voting app had access to do any actions inside this application. However, it'd be really crappy if the user had to go to the voting app every time and say, you know, I'd like to start a new transaction. I'd like to pay somebody. Oh, I'd like to admit new tokens. It's really difficult. There's like a layer of abstraction from them and the actual action that they want to take. So instead, what we do is we allow people to make direct actions on the apps that they want to. Let's say finance, we want to make a payment. And Aragon JS in the background will look up the applications that you've installed and say, oh, I see, um, you actually don't have permission to directly invoke this action on finance, but it looks like I've been able to create a graph, a dependency graph from you. You have permission to make a new vote, but, or rather, and uh, this voting contract has permission to pay somebody. And so it'll resolve this dependency graph and show you options about who or like what you can actually do to achieve that action, that end action that you intended. And so in this example, we see that uh, I think uh, she were in the voting app, but it should be, if you imagine if we were in the finance app, we want to pay, we can go through voting or we can go through the token manager who then starts a vote, who then ultimately executes um, the action if the voting goes through. And now we'll finally go all the way back up to the DOM and just talk a little bit about our UI framework. So we use React and we've created a library uh, called Aragon UI that's meant to be Ethereum native. It's meant to be Aragon native so that anybody in the world can very easily just take components out of this and make applications on the front end that look very similar to the ones that we currently deploy. And so users get a very cohesive experience when they install all their applications and play around their organization. And to kind of end this section of the, uh, of the deep dive, I kind of want to talk about a real DAO that's in use right now. It's only on the, or actually we just deployed it to mainnet, but it's really only being used on Rinkabee. So this is not quite a traditional DAO in the way that, or a traditional organization in the way that you might think of one. But if you think about package managers like NPM, uh, like PIP, like Cargo, they are kind of organizations. And they govern who has the access or who has the access rights to create a repo, to create a new package, and to update the versions on these uh, packages. And so the Aragon Package Manager is a set of contracts that we've deployed, now both in Mainnet and Rinkabee, that uses the entire Aragon stack to say um, who is able to deploy a package to this package manager and how they can do that. So this is really great for uh, things like smart contracts uh, that have front ends for things like versioned websites. It could even host Git repos because at the end of the day, this package manager, it says, oh, you're trying to deploy something. Your code address in Ethereum is at this other address. And if you have a front end, if you have some files, just add an IPFS hash, add a swarm hash, and I'll keep that there. Uh, so that anybody, if you're using version one, they go through and they resolve version one through the package manager and they get back that contract address that can't change and an IPFS hash that they can pull and uh, get the files from. But the really interesting thing is that Aragon governance is baked into this uh, organization so that you can control who actually has access to create new packages and who can version these repos. Um, for example, right now on Rinkeby and Mainnet, only Aragon internal people uh, have access to the full package manager and we've deployed a more open one uh, to Rinkeby and hopefully to mainnet soon uh, called open.aragonpm.eth where um, for us at least only members we've restricted it to private keys within the organization to say you're allowed to create a new version you're allowed to create a new repo but if you think about it any organization can start doing this and deploying their own package managers to control who uh, like which packages that they receive we can start using more interesting governance mechanisms about uh, potentially a list of people, a whitelisted um, group of people who are able to uh, have access to manage and version these repos. And you can start building more and more complex uh, requirements into that governance structure. Along with this, we also have a web 2.0 bridge. Uh, I said before, we don't really like central servers. We don't really like to host stuff. 
But we had to make a concession because Web3 right now is kind of hard to get to um, if you're in Chrome or Firefox. So we have this kind of, uh, we have a server that basically goes through and reads these Aragon PM events from Ethereum and says, anytime there's a new repo, anytime there's a new version, I'm gonna get that and I'm gonna pin the IPFS hash locally uh, so that we keep that around for people. And we also serve that to people if they need to. We resolve that IPFS hash for them. This is kind of a complex diagram. Um, again, maybe really good eyes uh, are needed for this. But it kind of lays out the structure of how we've made this organization as the package manager. Um, so you'll see the APM DAO kernel. This kernel is the same one that we were talking about. This one um, is basically where the package manager lives. And it has a few apps. It has a registry app. It has a, an ENS registrar app. Uh, and it also has a repo app. So that when you want to register something, you go through the registry apps to say, I want to make this, am I allowed to do it? I want to claim this ENS name, am I allowed to do that? And if I am, I'll deploy a new proxy to the repo, uh, to the actual repo contract to say this is where my repo lives now. And, th and this repo holds state about uh, where your application's Ethereum contract might be and what IPFS hash uh, I might include. And along with all of this, um, we again want to make it very easy for people to create their own applications so that users can install. So hack guides are coming soon. We're getting ready to uh, do wild hackathons. So it'll be really easy, hopefully. Within the span of maybe 30 minutes to an hour, you'll get something simple built, and then uh, the world's kind of from there. You have un kind of unlimited flexibility afterwards, um, as long as you kind of adhere to that context that we were talking about. Uh, now, kind of picking ourselves back up from the, from the tech details, um, we're going to look ahead as to what Aragon might be in the future. Because Aragon is not just a product. Uh, we're not just a startup making this product. We're not a Spanish startup. We're not a company trying to profit off of this product, but we won't really want to be a movement. We have vision, or we have values and a vision that hopefully other people agree with us and can align with us. And so we want to decentralize our development in this space as well. We don't want to be the only team that works in this space, uh, trying to achieve this mission, mission that I hope a lot of us kind of agree with. And so we're starting to split um, the fundraising money and the teams that are working, uh, using this money to work on Aragon. And we've just completed the, the first step today, actually. We're announcing Aragon 1, um, which is the first development company uh, that's split from the foundation. So the foundation will start giving out grants, development grants to companies uh, to work on the core infrastructure and to, to work on um, infrastructure that advances the vision. And hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have at least another team or two getting funded from the foundation, um, working alongside us in building out this platform. We have a pretty big community. We have a lot of people on our Rocket Chat. Uh, we have a lot of token holders. We have quite a few Twitter followers. And we also participate inside the community uh, through programs like Aragon Labs, where we partner uh, and, and work with other blockchain native um, organizations who want to create that community governed structure that we all want as well. So we're working with people like District Zero X to figure out how they might incorporate Aragon uh, into their decision making and how their community, the District Zero X communities, can also leverage Aragon. And so this is an open call to Hangout. We're available um, on GitHub and Rocket Chat, uh, Twitter as well, of course. But if you want, um, and you find this really interesting, we're hiring as well. We have a number of positions, um, and we really need help. Because um, there's a lot of stuff to build out. I don't know if you saw how complex that was, but that's quite a lot of complexity for what we are currently is four developers full time. Um, so we like all the help that we can get. And from other people as well, we're starting bounty programs. We're starting, um, we're, we're really interested in other ways to leverage the open source community to get them helping us um, really drive this mission forward. This is us. Um, this is pretty much all of us, two months ago. And we work distributed um, across North America, South America, and Europe right now. Where was that picture? This one. Where was it taken? 
Uh, this was in Spain uh, a couple months ago. And finally, uh, our other initiative is Aragon Nest, where if you don't want to join, you can still get funding, you can still get money. Um, we have kind of a wish list of projects that we like people to take, but anybody can submit new ideas. Uh, and if those are open source and we feel that they contribute to the community, um, we'll give people upwards of $50,000 to $100,000 um, for funding to deliver that promise. And so to kind of flash back to what Aragon all is all about, we're really at our heart thinking about how governance can be improved in decentralized systems and how we can use these decentralized systems to solve the world's most complex, most bureaucratic problems. And if you haven't, uh, we have a really cool video. Um, I hope you all watch it. It's really neat. It uh, hopefully will motivate um, a lot of what we've been talking about and kind of give you an idea of the fight that we're fighting. So thank you. Sure, for the token, yeah. Um, so, as I said, the token, we're still working on its utility. Um, if you'd like to learn more, I'd suggest you ask Luke, because he's the one in charge of that, and he's been building out the white paper quite a lot. So he's, he's here, and he's really uh, the best to talk about that. As to whether or not it could have been done without the token, um, I mean, up to now, yes, our token doesn't do anything right now, but the plan is for it to be incorporated inside the network in such a way that it's defensible. And so really, if we look at our mission going forward, I don't think it could have been done without a token. Maybe it was a little bit too early for it, but still, it's not something that could have been done without it. Uh, another question. So there's a pretty hefty part of like the web, the web application mm -hmm. called JavaScript. Now, is this, just to understand for you guys, okay, is this more like a byproduct because you had to build all the DAO framework and then, oh, we also do this JavaScript, so let's do this and open source this part, or is this part of like your main mission as you guys see it? Like, what kind of potential? Uh, it's really two parts um, because, oh, sorry, yeah. Um, so the question is, uh, for the front end, was that kind of a byproduct when we started developing um, on Ethereum? Was that something that uh, we just kind of did because we had to, or is it a core part of the, of the mission? And I'd say that, you know, a network is really, it's not useful if you don't have entities inside of it. And you can't really expect people to play with Ethereum contracts. And so we need to build a user-friendly user -friendly UI on top of that so people can manage their organizations and participate inside the network. And so that is really a core part of what we're trying to, to show. Uh, question. Do you guys, like, do you really for, for organizations to use, basically, for people to create organizations? So it, it's very, in a way, it's very abstract. Like you kind of need to guess what requirements people might have because it's still very early. I imagine people are knocking at your doors all the time and telling you, oh, I have, to, I have to do this for my DAO, I have to do this. So are you guys managing it between the early users that there are out there and they need to kind of, I imagine, guessing a lot of what people might need? Do you have a process for that? Yeah. So the question was whether or not we have a process, I guess, for product development in terms of our early users of our organizations, because the, the concept of an organization is quite abstract and it leaves a lot of open questions. Um, and I'd say that right now, the, the main default that we take is to provide flexibility. So that if you have a use case that we don't support, um, you're able to do that yourself or you're able to tell us and we'll be able to incorporate that change or incorporate an application of some sort to handle your use case. Um, and if we can't, then there's a problem and you should talk to us. There's also the labs. Yes, as well. So there's also the labs initiative where we're working with really our early core um, user base, these other Ethereum native projects, to uh, learn about what their needs are, what they want to do, and how we can both together 
uh, collaborate to fulfill that need. And they're going to be your first generation of users, basically, because their approach is already to use so elements of our Yeah, so are these labs programs, the question was, are these labs uh, projects the first users, the first core users? Um, of course, there are current users, but they're, I mean, the, the current app right now is, does not allow you to do very much. Um, and of course, you can take the contracts, who, which do have the entire flexibility, and play with those yourself. Uh, and we have seen a few projects kind of using these contracts and basing off of them to, to work. But right now, um, we're not really doing that much to, to support them. I, I think that will come afterwards when we have more UI built more uh, of the front end built out, so they're more extensible and people can do a lot more with it than right now. Cool, we'll start, yeah. How does your um, bounty program work? So the question is, how does our bounty program work? Uh, so we use op Status Open Bounty. Um, they have a platform where we just label stuff on GitHub and say, we'd like this to get worked on, and someone can go to Status Open Bounty or on our GitHub repo and pick up issues that they like to take. Um, and we fund basically smart contracts so people know for sure that there's some amount of money inside this bounty. Um, what is that so the website is status, I think it's openbounty.status.io, I think. You can, if you Google status open bounty, it'll be easy to find. Besides so the front end you're talking about, is there any plans for perhaps making like APIs to interact with DAOs, or is it kind of just like at the smart contract level? Mm -hmm. uh, the question is if we plan to make an API or maybe a more generic or featureful API for um, interacting with organizations. Um, that's in many ways what Aragon JS is meant to be, but it isn't right now. Uh, so we might. Well, we probably will add or try to add some features to Aragon JS or a slightly different library um, so people can kind of interact with these contracts without having to deal with them like just through Web3. Um, but dealing with them or dealing with Web3 for them is not that complicated, I guess. It depends on your use case. But if you want to say create a new vote, it's really like you call contract.new vote with your parameters and there's not much else. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it depends on the use case, but uh, I think we're still trying to figure out what that would mean for other people because we'd like most application at least to build on top of the Aragon stack and for them to just um, seamlessly and smoothly get put inside the wrapper uh, app. Yeah. So it seems like you're focusing a lot on, on the client application, but would it be possible to hook into the, what you call the, the web worker, mm -hmm. so that you can, you know, from command line or from some automation to produce transactions or to communicate with Aragon JS and then have the, uh, some callbacks and then you have things happening uh, in, in your infrastructure based on the callbacks of the Aragon OS? Okay, so the, I'm not quite sure actually what you're, what I'm saying is that about. it seems like you're focusing too much on mm -hmm. users just clicking around, mm -hmm. and it would be interesting to interface directly with Aragon JS ah, okay. from some other algorithm right. tools. Right. Yeah. The question is whether or not I guess we plan to build more features into Aragon JS so that people can interact with that programmatically versus with a UI. Um, again, I think very similar response. It's the contracts themselves. These applications are not complicated, so. Web3 or ethers.io might be enough if you have the ABI. Um, we do support a command line interface. We have a, we have a CLI tool that allows people to spin up uh, repos really easily um, so that they can start hacking away on their own application or to do complex uh, organization management, whether that's installing new apps, changing permissions, doing whatever. You can do that on the CLI. Um, but I guess what you're asking for is kind of like a generic library to handle that. Well, no, there is a CLI, it seems like. Kind of, yeah. I mean, we could make like a JavaScript module or something to be like. It's a CLI. <laughs> cool. Uh, how does the voting contract work and like how customizable is it 
And for example, if someone loses their keys and now you can't get enough people to vote for something, like mm -hmm. how, what do you do? Because like in normal companies, you have legal system and you have like other ways to you know to get stuff done. Like how does it work here? So the voting contract that we currently have is very, um, I'd say simple. It's uh, also a little bit naive, um, but it's meant to kind of showcase what you can do with these types of systems. Um, the way we also think about these applications is that once you've configured them for the first time, you shouldn't be allowed to change them uh, because that opens up a lot of problems, especially in voting. If you start changing like the, uh, the majority rate or the quorum or things like that, it starts to kind of screw with people's mental models of how that voting works. So the idea is to kind of create multiple voting applications, like install multiple instances of a voting application to handle different tasks if you have different voting structures. Um, as for voting itself, um, basically uh, we, the, our voting application is meant to be binding. So you have a yes, no choice of an action that um, gets described to you. So should I pay this person money? Yes, no. If it's yes, then for sure it's going to execute that. If no, then it'll drop out. To protect against the case of people losing their keys and not achieving participation, um, on one hand, like if you need to vote yes and you've lost your keys, um, there's not much that you can really do because also your tokens are kind of bound inside uh, that organization. But the organization, if you've set it up in a way where you have kind of fallbacks, so you can start removing people's tokens. You can start burning them um, if you desire, and that way, that way you can kind of remove keys uh, and get new ones. You can also, so the one thing that we allow people to change on voting is the quorum size. So for example, if something uh, is a decision and it's kind of, it has really good um, yes, no percentages, but it's not reaching the minimum quorum, let's say you need 10% of all people to vote yes, then what you can do is you can either wait or cancel or try to cancel this, this vote um, and change that participation rate or whoever can, you know, whatever governance system you've kind of set up to change that. You can change that participation rate and then do another vote. Um, so there's a couple kind of fallbacks and it's up to the organization to provide some of these fallbacks using whatever structure they encode. And a follow-up question. So do you think Aragon would be good for making like uh, the DAO 2.0, like a new version of that? Mm, I guess if you really wanted to. Oh, the question was if we could use Aragon to make the DAO again. Um, the DAO being the 2016 DAO. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I guess you could if you wanted to. It's flexible enough for you to do that um, with a little bit, well, yeah, pr pretty much everything. It's, you kind of arbitrary anything as long as you set up the permissions correctly. Um, so yes, I mean, you can kind of do anything in a contract and then just hook that up. So, programming. <laughs> well, I'll take the one on the left. Yeah. Oh, yes, um, that's like, seems to me like the way you describe the project also is completely derivative from the goal you want to achieve. Uh, looks to me like the way you software allow people to create the organization. <clears throat> but instead of decentralized, actually, the people who make, who, who create the organization also set up the rule. That means from other people's perspective, you want to expand the organization where it looks like either you join this organization because of other people set up or you don't. So, seems like mm -hmm. the organization created by a few people, not, it's not a decentralized creation of the organization, right. created by a few people and then invite other people either you join or you don't. Right. Uh, so the question is um, the way we've kind of described the, the software now seems counterintuitive to, the, to Aragon's end goals of creating open organizations because a lot of what we've been talking about is kind of creating structures and um, encoding structures of governance in these organizations so you either buy in or you don't. Um, I'd say one thing that we didn't really talk about was how flexible the process is to create organizations. So I showed you that example, that really simplified example where we set up an organization with just the voting app and a few others, and the voting app only had access to those apps. Um, but we can kind of extend 
that factory to do anything you want. And it's just code. Again, it's programming. So you can do whatever you want to, and you can have it trusted because uh, people can look at the code, they can participate together in creating that factory and creating that, uh, what we call kit, uh, to spin up their organization so that they are making the decisions together rather than um, either joining or not. As well, um, the end goal is to allow enough flexibility so people can create whatever organization they want to. And we can probably imagine very open organizations that allow people to join and make requests to say, I'd like to change this about this organization. I don't like that. Um, and if they don't, then that's kind of their fault for setting up their organization that way. Um, yeah. Does that kind of kind of loosen that remark? Yeah. I kind of get it. So you basically need to make your software become adaptable to allow different rules to happen. That's yep. the organization can, you, you commerce can change the rules. Basically, you allow people to do that. Yeah. And you can change the rules later. You just have to have enough buy in from everybody else in your organization. Or you just have to have well, power. You define the voting rule to whether you allow yes. people to change them. Yeah. But the, the, the second question related to that is it seems like for that organization, migrate to new ones depends on what software to. Right now, it seems to me like the software from a template. This organization pick this template voting app, maybe some other app. Mm -hmm. And you as organization, everyone needs to provide those templates. And somehow you need to provide as fast as possible, as flexible as possible for people to use it. Um, but currently, giving your limited resources, or your, your, your own limited imagination, you can only think for things that mm -hmm. you can think of. It. Yeah. Um, it's not your fault, but just whatever you have. It's not your fault. So I guess the question is, um, with our resource constraints, uh, what to what degree can we provide um, these kind of factories for people to, to create new organizations? Um, and I'd say that we do have limited resources, but it's, again, the open source movement where you can pick it up and you can make one yourself and then you can distribute that. You can take one of ours and you can change it if you don't like it. Um, so it's very much that, you know, if you don't like it, you can change it and, and spin it up yourself. Can you imagine people creating non-decentralized autonomous organizations? So perhaps mm -hmm. spinning up a, a company mm -hmm. and then yep. so having it automatically registered in uh, some registry of a country that is mm -hmm. okay with this kind of organization. Yeah, so the question is whether we can put, or like, if we can put traditional organization structures into this new model, uh, for example, C Corps or private um, uh, limited liability corps and whatnot. And uh, of course, um, I mean, we will probably also provide a template for people to use if they want to just put a C Corp on the blockchain. Um, now, the problem with what you're talking about is this registry of uh, like adding yourself to a registry to in a country that represent like that accepts that registry, um, and that's like we, we don't control any of that. So. Well, that's, uh, <laughs> but it's possible. Yeah, for that to, to convince and to educate the yeah. different regulators to, to realize course. that this is just another medium to express uh, some form of organization. Of yeah. Example. For example, if Duke in Switzerland decides one day to uh, acknowledge. DAOs as entities inside Switzerland, uh, if they put themselves inside a registry, then of course. Um, but also in the future that hopefully becomes part of the Aragon network. Maybe Zug is kind of a sub-network inside the Aragon network where if you want to participate in Zug, you kind of have to be inside this network and you then have access to um, collaborate or um, uh, you like create contracts with other DAOs or organizations inside that network. Malta, Malta has something like this. Mm -hmm. So Malta is creating a, a law that lets DAOs be like recognized legally in their country. I guess we can use Malta then. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah.
Yeah. Uh, so you said it's not yet ready for production, right? Do you have any TA? The, the contracts have been audited yet, or do you have any yeah. TA when? Um, when we say soon. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, when is it ready? Um, and the answer to that is soon. Um, we are undergoing two audits. So we're wrapping up one, and we're in the middle of another one for the smart contracts. Um, and then after that, we will most likely deploy uh, Aragon, the current version, to mainnet, and then start spinning up organizations to govern Aragon itself, or uh, to do like organizational stuff like provide payroll, make decisions, etc. So this is going in, like without committing to weeks, months, more. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So if I want to use this in projects, like what? <laughs> right, yeah. right. Um, yeah, let's let's be safe and say months. <laughs> I hope that's arbitrary. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. Thank you so much, Brett. Thank you guys.